So, good morning, everybody. Good morning, everybody here at the auditorium. Uh, welcome to another seminar. Today, we will have the talk by Dr. Marilou Gendron Marsolais from the ESO, and uh, she's working here at the IAA. And she will talk about a journey into the Perseus cluster of galaxies. Uh, Marilou, she's a uh, ESO postdoctoral fellow. In the last year of the fellowship, uh, she's working here at the Instituto de Astrofísica de Medicina since December uh, 2021 working closely with uh, Lourdes uh, Verdes Montenegro. She made the uh, PhD at the University of Montreal in 2018 under the supervision of Julie Lavasek uh, Larro. Uh, thank you very much, Marilou, for being here, and the floor is yours. Okay, so now I think I'm on mute, and it should be all fine, right? I hope so. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, well, hello, everybody. Uh, hello on Zoom. Uh, it's really nice to be here to finally be able to talk about my science with you to, so that you guys know what I'm actually doing. Um, so I have prepared this talk, um, a journey into the galaxy, into the Perseus clusters of galaxy. Um, so this is the outline oops, of the talk here. And um, so what I want to do really today is kind of present to you what radio telescope can teach us about galaxy clusters. And because we've made a lot of progress with radio facilities over the last, let's say 20 years or something like that. And I, can't to, I kind of want to give you an update about that because we made a lot of discoveries and I don't think you guys are, are aware of how spectacular and interesting these environment galaxy clusters are at radio wavelength. So I want to give you some sort of an update on that. So yes, I'm going to talk about the, the Perseus cluster. This is going to be like one like deeper example that I'm going to detail. Uh, but I really uh, going to do like a big introduction. Okay, It's going to take most of the time um, to talk about what are galaxy cluster? What do we learn uh, from these uh, environments? What are the, the recent advances in radio observation? Uh, that I just told you about, and all of these open, new open questions that we have to face with this new observation. Uh, then yes, I'm gonna go deeper in that in that particular cluster. It's a very nearby galaxy cluster. It's my favorite galaxy cluster, really. Uh, I've been studying it since the beginning of my PhD. Uh, if you want to know more about these results, uh, about my work, really, uh, these are three papers that I'm gonna really very quickly show during the during the talk and a list of all these great peoples that that helped me uh, to to reach to those paper let's say and then uh, very quickly also i will give you what some sort of a personal glimpse into what i think is going to be the future of galaxy cluster studies at radio wavelength okay so this is the program for for today um okay so what are galaxy clusters galaxy clusters are the largest gravitationally bound structure in our universe they are made of thousands of galaxies they extend on megaparsec scale and apparently they are very trendy right <laughs> because this was the first uh, jwst image that was released of uh this beautifully named uh, galaxy cluster um this is in the infrared. There's lots of things, uh, lots of people probably are gonna do a lot of research about that uh, particular cluster with those new data. It's really amazing. But what I'm gonna tell you about today is really more about the radio side or the X-ray side also of, of galaxy clusters. So let's go more into detail. What are galaxy cluster made of? Well, they're made of galaxies, obviously, uh, but that's just a small portion of the total mass of galaxy clusters. Um, one more thing that I want to say about galaxies right now is that in the center of galaxy cluster, you have what we call BCGs, brightest cluster galaxies, which are kind of special galaxies. They lie into the special environment in the center of clusters. They show special characteristics. And um, for example, in the Perseus cluster, so I, I forgot to tell you, but this is the Perseus clusters. You're going to see that the whole time. <laughs> Every time I have an example is basically uh, the Perseus cluster and the central galaxy uh, in Perseus is this one, NGC 1275. Uh, and when you look at it in the optical, you see those really big uh, filaments. Yeah, I don't know if you can close some of the eyes, that would be perfect. 
Um, so optical emission line nebula around many of those BCGs, okay? This is one of the most spectacular example, but there are many uh, BCGs like that. Um, so I've been studying, um, I just wanted to say a quick word about that because I've been working on these uh, galaxies in, in, in the optical. So I've been using IFU like CITEL, so maybe you know that instrument on the CFHT. It's an IFU with a very large field of view, 11 by 11 arc minutes, so really, really big, which is essential if you want to study something like this, which is almost four arc minutes in the sky, okay? This is like, it's so close that it's kind of a problem because it occupies a very large portion of the sky. And if you want to have a velocity map of those filaments, you need a really big IFU. So this is what CITEL uh, provided for the first time. And um, it's really cool with, with IFU because you can get a, a cube, right? Of those observations, Oops. I will. I hopefully this will start. No. Well, I don't know why it's not starting. Well, this was a beautiful video, but <laughs> it is working. Oh, it's working now. Yes. Who oh, awesome. So then you see uh, these lines. So you just saw the N two H alpha and N two. This was a. Uh, foreground galaxy, which is a bit more redshifted, and you have the two S2 lines as well at the end of the cube. So this is one filter of uh, that instrument, and you can see all the crazy, chaotic velocity structure in those filaments, okay? We don't really understand why, what are those filaments doing there, how they are uh, produced, but that's not like the topic of the talk, but if you have more questions, you can ask um, later if you want. Okay. Now, this is galaxies, all right? Uh, then, of course, the majority of the mass in, in, in galaxy cluster is the dark matter component. But there's another component that is uh, quite important, uh, which is the intracluster medium, which I've represented here really just for like visu visual support, right? In, in the blue color, okay, let's see here, that occupy the cluster center. What is this uh, intracluster medium? It's a hot diffuse plasma that fill cluster centers. And it's actually really hot and it needs a lot of X-ray photons. So if you want, if you look at uh, with an X-ray telescope at a galaxy cluster, you will see a bright extended source of X-ray photons. Okay, this is a very good way to study galaxy clusters. Um, this is great, but it emits actually uh, so much um, X-ray photons that all of this gas should be uh, cooling uh, towards the center, towards the BCG very rapidly. And so BCGs should be forming a lot of stars, but this is not at all what we observe. Most of uh, brightest cluster galaxies are not forming a lot of stars. So something, this is what we call the cooling flow problem. So something is preventing this cooling from happening. Something is keeping this gas hot all the time so that it doesn't cool down and form stars onto the central galaxy. What could it be? Uh, well, we're gonna have a look at a little bit more about uh, these galaxies here in cluster to have the answer to that. Um, so these galaxies inside cluster have supermassive black hole right in their center. Uh, a subset of these galaxies are what we call actives, right? They have accreting black hole. And some of these black hole can produce uh, jets here uh, of relativistic electrons, which when they are embedded inside magnetic fields produce synchrotron emission, okay? Um, and, and, and given like the, the strength of the magnetic field, the energy of these particles, we have synchrotron emission at about one gigahertz, so radio emission. So during this whole talk, I'm gonna be talking about radio emission. But what I mean by that is synchrotron emission, so non-thermal uh, continuum emission, all right? Let's talk a, bit, a little bit more about the spectrum. So what's the spectrum of synchrotron emission that what it looks like? Well, it's the combination of each of these electrons, right, in the in those jets, and you have if you have a power of these electrons, then you will get uh, a power loss spectrum as well, and the slope here, the spectral index alpha, this slope here will give you a lot of information about the population of electrons that you have. Okay, so if you have a flatter spectra, okay, uh, you will have more emission at higher frequencies. That means that you have a very energetic population of, of relativistic electrons. If you have a steeper st spectra, then that means that if you're only observing it at very low radio frequencies, that means that you have a, uh, a less energetic uh, population of electrons. Okay, so that's, this is very good 
for us to understand you know, these jets, the, the level of energy of these particles. What does it look like? Uh, you, you have probably seen these kind of images in the radio of these beautiful jets. For Perseus, it's a bit less impressive, I would say. So you have these radio jets here in the central um, galaxy. Now, these jets are, are really big in some, time. In some cases, it's, it, they are extend to way, way, way beyond uh, the whole galaxy. So they are going to encounter the intracluster medium, right? That blue thing I was showing you uh, before. So what happened when these two things interact? Well, to find out, we're going to look at Chandra observation, for example, of galaxy clusters. So the blue thing I was showing you, these are actual uh, real observation with Chandra of galaxy clusters. And so you see that it's not at all a uniform distribution of gas, right? There's a lot of structure in that gas. And you have these uh, space here that are kind of empty, and they correspond uh, exactly to uh, to these jets here. So that was a fantastic discovery when these people like match these observations together. And the first time that was done was in the Perseus cluster, by the way. <laughs> and so uh, basically, these jets uh, literally like push away the cluster, the intracluster medium gas. They inflate cavities inside that gas, and they mechanically heat that gas. So that cooling flow problem doesn't happen uh, most likely, uh, we think, because of that AGN mechanical feedback, okay, that we have, you have probably heard many times about. Uh, and so if you calculate the power of these jets, if you calculate the power that it takes to create those cavities, it matches really, really well. Now, the, the exact mechanism of how the energy is transferred to the intracluster medium through turbulence or shocks or things like that, this is still a little bit of a matter of debate, I would say, the details of how this actually works. But it's remarkable, right? Because the black hole is really small inside that uh, galaxy and is still, it is ruling the entire galaxy cluster dynamics. It's quite remarkable. Okay, uh, so this is what happened in the center. This is a beautiful image of the Perseus cluster. Again, you have the brightest cluster galaxy here. We kind of de-zoom a little bit. Uh, but so this galaxy is active, it has radio jets, but it's not the only one, right? There's other, actually all of these uh, <laughs> gift things that I've added are uh, radio galaxies also that are part of uh, the Perseus cluster. So what, do, what happened with these galaxies? They are also in the intracluster medium. What happened with them? Well, we're gonna look at radio, uh, radio image, uh, but to do that, I'm gonna, take like some sort of a historic way to, to explain to you that. And we're gonna look at the first, what I think is the first uh, published image of the Perseus cluster at radio wavelength, okay? This is more than 50 years old, okay? So we've been studying that cluster for a very long time. Uh, you have the, the radio jets I was telling you about here, the BCG, and you have these two very weird uh, radio galaxy. Uh, that have that sort of head tail morphology, right? This is observation with the, one my telescope in the UK. And the first explanation for that strange shape uh, that they were first observing in, in the Perseus cluster was this one. So they say in the paper that this interaction is almost certainly, I like how they were like so sure, <laughs> almost certainly due to the incidence of a relativistic particle injected from the nucleus. Uh, so basically there's some, some sort of wind of particles from that central galaxy and it creates those shape, right? With this alignment, it seems like it makes sense. However, what happened is like a bit later, they found out a new source with the same type of morphology, this one here, with, uh, which is bigger here, CR15. And this one points in the opposite direction, right? So it completely ruled out this wind idea. And, uh, and so what they propose here, uh, they propose a simpler explanation namely that the extended source are radio galaxies in their own right, all right, important, and that direction and the form of the radio tail all suggest the motion of the radio galaxy resisted through a gaseous medium. So these galaxies are going through something and they have these uh, morphology. What are, are they going through? Well, like I said, the intracluster medium, right? But at this time, they, the people were just starting to observe at X-ray wavelength. So they were just starting to discover that many galaxy clusters are extended source at, at X-ray wavelengths. So you can see here in optical, the, the background in optical, the dashed line here are the two radio source, and this is the detection in X-ray, 
Okay, this is the resolution that they had at that moment. Okay, and then more and more radio observation of radio galaxies with strange morphology. So not stray jets, but jets are kind of bent and things like that. And so finally, the, the main idea of these so-called bent jet radio galaxies now is that, yeah, you have an active radio galaxy with jets, but it is going, it is moving through the intracluster medium. And so what happened is that, uh, as you see in the simulation, these jets are gonna be bent uh, back like this as they move, as they experience the ramp pressure through the intracluster medium, okay? So the higher the velocity, the relative velocity between the galaxy and the intracluster medium, uh, the higher the ramp pressure and the more bent the jets are gonna be, okay? And it's important here to say that this velocity is not just the host galaxy. Sometimes these galaxies don't move a lot inside cluster, especially if they are close to the center, uh, but maybe the intracluster medium itself is moving and is creating enough ramp pressure to create this bending. And this is fantastic because this is exactly what we observe now, right? This is a, one of my image of NGC 1265, which is the prototype of these kind of bend jet uh, radio galaxies. And it really looks basically the same as these um, simulations. Now, this is the, the current classification scheme that we have of bend jet radio galaxies. They have many names, it's a bit confusing, but I will try to keep this one for, for the rest of the talk. And uh, depending on the opening angle of these jets, uh, people have been trying to classify them like this, uh, but I think it's a bit problematic and you will see that during my talk. But for example, just if we try to uh, classify this prototype, right, of Benjet Radio Galaxy. So when you look like this, okay, it might look like a narrow angle tail radio galaxy, but if you add only high resolution, not very deep observation, then you will only see the brightest part of the jets. And that looks more like a wide angle tail radio galaxy, right? And then again, if you had other types of radio observation that are not very deep, not very high resolution, then you will see like we, we saw back in the days, uh, only that and that looks like a head tail. So it becomes very difficult to classify these sources depending on the type of surveys that you are doing. And that's just the tip of the problem I will show you later. Um, because uh, there's actually much more uh, radio emission, synchrotron emission inside galaxy cluster. I've told you about jets, but uh, really, oops, I don't know if this is what, yeah, okay. But really, this is what it looks like when you look at uh, with the sufficiently uh, deep observation of the Perseus cluster. So all of this here is what we call a mini halo. It's a halo of emission, synchrotron emission that fill completely the cluster center inside Perseus. And we know about 30 cluster or maybe right now probably more uh, of these kind of cluster with very uh, central radio emission. So this, all of this diffuse emission is not related to any, directly related to any radio galaxy, okay? It's just there filling the cluster center. And things are even more dramatic when you look at merging cluster because Perseus is kind of relaxed. It is, it is interacting a little bit, but it's not a merging cluster. Uh, but if you look at an example like this, all the, the pink here is also radio emission. And you see things like giant radio halo. So this is like a small version of that, that fills completely the cluster center. And you see things like this. Um, there's many names, but sometimes we call them relics, which are super elongated uh, structure that we found in clusters outskirts, okay? Uh, so what, uh, what's happening there? Um, because all of this is synchrotron emission, right? So you need, as I said, two things to make synchrotron emission. You need relativistic electrons and magnetic fields. So that means that, the, that there's a lot of magnetic fields all around this cluster. Uh, but the problem is that imagine you have these, uh, the central galaxy, you have the, beast, the, the, the supermassive black hole, the jets. Imagine these electrons traveling, diffusing through the cluster. What happened with the spectrum is that as the get older, let's say, they will lose energy through synchrotron emission and then their spectra are gonna get steeper and steeper until they don't emit synchrotron emission anymore because they are not relativistic anymore. And actually the radiative time scale of these electrons from the jet is shorter than the time required for them to reach there. So it, there's a problem there. There needs to be some source of energy here uh, that is able to reaccelerate these these electrons back to relativistic speed so that they emit 
still synchrotron emission, okay? And it's even more dramatic on this scale, okay? This is one megaparsec. Okay? These, these things are really, really giant source of radio emission. So what is that source of energy uh, that can reaccelerate those particles that are kind of tired? Um, well, to answer that, we're gonna look at a uh, simulation of galaxy cluster, a really nice uh, simulation by, by this group of people. Um, this is uh, X-ray, okay, let's say X-ray uh, of a galaxy of emerging uh, galaxy cluster. And uh, this is a snapshot actually uh, five giga years after uh, the merger of a cluster with a subcluster. And what happened when that when, when this happened <laughs> is that the all this intracluster medium gas will be displaced, right? Because the gravitational potential is perturbed by this other subcluster, right? And there is going to be like a sloshing motion of the gas. And this is shown here by these spiraling uh, what we call cold front, okay? So you can see like sharp uh, features in the X-ray. So that we detected, there's a lot of that in the, in the Perseus cluster as well. Um, and so you can see that in this simulation, okay? But uh, what, what is great about the simulation is that not only shows um, this interaction with the subcluster, but it's also gonna show, right now I'm gonna show you, uh, uh, jets basically from the central uh, galaxy, okay? So you're gonna see the jets being released, uh, but still the this merging is happening. And so slowly you're gonna see back these, this very nice spiraling shape appearing. So it would be really nice to know what happened with these particles, right? That are released in those jets. Where do they go inside the cluster? And this is something that the simulation also shows. So this is not synchrotron emission. This is just like where tracing the particles, where these uh, electrons are going. So you will see the jets forming and the cavities, but very quickly, uh, this sloshing motion kind of spread the particles all around the cluster, uh, filling the cluster center and creating even like arcs like this, okay? So what we think is happening right now, and this is like a very recent idea, like in the last few years, um, we think that um, the ICM motion, so the intracluster medium motion, uh, are able to re-accelerate these particles and, and give them a little bit more energy as they are here super far, but there is so much motion there that is able to kind of re-accelerate them a little bit so that we observe, uh, you know, a halo, for example, or relics and, and, and things like that, okay? So this is the current idea. Um, okay, so kind of a summary of all of that. There was a lot of things that I said, uh, but basically synchronon emission is, uh, in galaxy cluster is not only found in, in the central radio jet, like you might think there's other radio galaxies, but there's also um, uh, radio emission that is found beyond these, those radio galaxies in large diffuse structures, okay? This is uh, the Perseus cluster. Um, and as I mentioned in the beginning, uh, we've made a lot of progress uh, lately in, in terms of radio observation of galaxy clusters. And this is due to several factors. First of all, we have increased uh, by a lot the number of facilities that are sensitive at very low radio frequencies, okay? Because as I said, if you remember the shape of that, uh, of that spectrum, um, if you want to observe these particles, the best is to go to the lowest frequency possible, right? If you want to catch the ones that have the less energy that are diffused everywhere in the cluster, you have to go to low frequency below one gigahertz. And before we didn't have that much facilities that were very sensitive at these specific uh, wavelengths, but now we have. Uh, we've increased the bandwidth of the receiver so that now we're, these facilities are much more sensitive. This is the case. So the VLA exists for, for a long time, GMRT as well, but they have been upgraded with better, uh, more sensitive receiver. And we have also improved by a lot uh, the imaging algorithms, okay? And the consequence of that, is that things got a bit crazy. <laughs> so this is an overview, very brief overview of what we have found with these new super good facilities. So we found relics, as I said, these weird elongated source. These, these are the two most famous one, the sausage, right? And the toothbrush, <laughs> great, great names. Uh, what else have we found? Things like that, Abel 2256, like, have you seen this thing? I don't know exactly what it is. It's full of filaments. You have this, um, uh, this long head tail, okay? 
So this is probably a galaxy with jets that are really, really bent. But these things stay collimated on like, well, this is 500 kiloparsec. So what is this thing doing there with all of these filaments here? We don't know. Uh, and there's another case here in a more uh, relaxed cluster. You have a mini halo, a bit like Perseus here. And you have this giant tail of emission right there, OK, in the, in the contour. You have the, I really like the name, the mist tail, <laughs> where you see these like quasi-periodic like blobs of radio emission inside that tail. We have never seen that before. Uh, and you might think that, you know, galaxy groups are a bit more quiet than galaxy clusters. They are smaller. Well, no, apparently, because you have these kind of sources. This is a galaxy group. All what you see in pink is radio emission. So crazy filaments, again, everywhere. It seems like filaments in radio emission is like a thing. It's like everywhere. Uh, other, another really impressive example that we have no idea. And things like Phoenix sources, name that we have given to these things, which are just patches of filamentary radio emission that appears somewhere in galaxy cluster that are not related to any radio galaxy. Okay, so this is the, the situation. So welcome to the strange world of galaxy cluster at radio wavelength, right? Uh, so we have many questions now. These are the open questions uh, that I think we need to answer. Uh, how to classify these source uh, is a big problem because they are so different. It's really hard to classify them now. And the, the, class, the classes that we had before do not really work anymore. What are their origin? How this reacceleration mechanism really works? It's a bit uh, unclear. Important thing, how do you link the cluster properties with those radio source properties? How these two things match together? We don't know. And magnetic fields, it's everywhere in the cluster for sure, but how is it distributed? What's the strength of it? Uh, yeah, that's again another big question, okay? So we have a lot of work to do with those new observations. Um, now, I want to, as I said, I want to give you like an idea of if we took one galaxy cluster and we have really good radio observation, what we can learn. So one other crazy example, let's say, and go a bit deeper into that. So uh, the Perseus cluster, X-ray brightest cluster in the sky, uh, very nearby, okay, barely a redshift there. 70 megaparsec away. And that's why it's so it's so much well-known, so much study. We have discovered so many things because it's so close uh, from us, right? So my work in all of that, uh, I've been working uh, with the VLA uh, on this cluster. So we've been working with collaborators on two different bands, uh, very low radio frequency. P band around 350 megahertz, L band around 1.5 uh, gigahertz with different configurations. So you are sensitive to different scales in those uh, in, the, in, in the image. So that's very, very important in the radio. And uh, my collaborator, Chad Hall, and Rick Perley, uh, more or less work on the L-band while I was working on, on the P-band observation. Now this seems kind of simple. One galaxy cluster, some VLA data, it should be okay. But the thing is that the central um, AGN inside the, the central galaxy in Perseus is 3C84. And you might know this because you might be using it as a calibrator. And I'm really happy for you because it's so bright and everything. But for me, it's a nightmare <laughs> because it is so bright <laughs> that it's just outshine everything just next to it, right? All this mini halo emission that I want to observe, uh, it's very challenging to get that. But with a lot of patience and work and expertise from my collaborators, we've been able to reach uh, quite high dynamic range uh, for these kind of radio observations with lots of different techniques. So this is the kind of radio map that I'm working with. So yeah, this is not composite image for once, <laughs> but actual radio map. So these are the two, uh, at two different resolution of the P-band, so 350 megahertz. And this is the L-band one at slightly higher uh, frequency, okay? And I'm gonna be uh, going through all of these things that you see in this map. Um, you may recognize a little bit, just to give you an idea, you may recognize the radio jets in the center. This is the mini halo I was telling you about, which is quite extended. And then there's all of these band jet radio galaxies. So these are all radio galaxies that are part of Perseus and have very interesting morphologies, okay? So I'm gonna go one by one and tell you what we have found with those specific data. Starting with the center, the mini halo, 
you've seen this map before, but you might not realize that when we observe mini halo normally, it's just like a blob of radio emission inside a cluster, okay? We don't see details in it. And suddenly with, with Perseus, we start to see these filaments. I mean, it's really not uniform, right? There's like edges, uh, extension. It's really not a uniform source of emission. There is structure inside that mini halo. And there's very few mini halo that show these kind of things, maybe one or two more. Um, I think maybe because it's the nearest uh, mini halo from us that we can we are able to resolve these kind of things. And it's very difficult with radio to have like the just enough uh, sort of resolution to, to pick up the diffuse stuff, but also to resolve details in it. It's like a bit challenging and by uh, a bit random, but uh, we have really just the perfect balance between those two things to be able to pick up all of this uh, structure. So that was a great uh, result from that, uh, from those data. Now, if we go to the Benjet radio galaxies, I've showed you before NGC 1265, right? So, um, I mean, it was a source that was known, as I said, long time ago. We see very high resolution detail in, in, in the tail here, many, many filaments, weird arcs and things like that. Uh, if you go to, as I said, lower resolution, you pick up more diffuse emission and you start to see this uh, extension of the tail, which is very strange and it bends on almost a full circle. This was also known before, uh, but uh, what we didn't know is that there was filaments as well inside uh, that tail. So I, as I mentioned, the filaments are everywhere with this uh, synchrotron emission. Now, the interpretation of that source, uh, I don't know. We still don't know, uh, really. There is different uh, possibilities, but um, for sure, I mean, if you look at this, uh, this morphology cannot be explained just by the, you know, the galaxy motion inside the cluster, right? You need to add something else. Even with some crazy projection effect, you kind of really not cannot, I don't think we can get to this thing. So there must be some level of interaction with the intracluster medium. This has been suggested before. Maybe this galaxy went through a shock inside the intracluster medium and it produced uh, this kind of, of morphology, but uh, we still have some work to do on that. Another interesting uh, Benjet radio galaxy is IC310. This was also, you know, this were the two that were identified like 50 years ago. Uh, IC310 is that uh, also like prototype of these head tail sources. Um, there's some nice weird morphology stuff uh, structure in that in the tail, but I want to focus on the fact that uh, with this higher resolution map, which was pretty much the highest resolution we had uh, of that uh, of that source, I was very surprised uh, to see that there is like this gap here. And it really looks like there is two narrow collimated jets, right, coming going out of that source. And just to confirm, you know, that it's not an imaging artifact or something like that, we went to uh, see other observation, and we seem to see like all the time this gap there. Now, I was really happy with this result. It was like, okay, it's a head tail, right? The, the jets are really, really bent, but when you look with sufficiently high resolution, you can resolve them. So, this is perfect. Um, but then I went to see like literature about IC310. And then I realized there's this whole part of the astronomical community that refer to IC310 as a blazar. So th there's actually gamma rays coming out of IC310. Uh, this, is in, this is the, the central galaxy and this is IC310 there. Very high energy emission coming from that source. So these people think that it's a normal, you know, radio galaxy with two jets, but one of the jets is towards us, right? So that we see directly the very high energy emission. So that doesn't work at all with the Benjet interpretation. So we were a bit confused and we think about that a little bit more with my collaborators. And we came up with this possible interpretation. We don't know if that's the right one, but basically it comes down to the fact that, you know, that radius of curvature here, those jets are really, really close to each other. This radius of curvature is really, really small. And probably like it is too small, probably it's due to a projection effect. So that this source probably looks more like a typical Benjet radio galaxies, but we are kind of seeing it edge on so that we are looking on the side like this. So if I mimic that with my end, instead of looking it like that, we kind of see it on the side. So the jets appear closer to each other, right? And then, um, and then for the gamma rays, well, we don't expect the gamma rays to be following the curvature. It probably will be beamed towards us anyway. So with that kind of 
projection effect, uh, uh, we think that blazars and band jet radio galaxy are not mutually exclusive phenomena. And that would be the first case of that. But that's an interpretation that, that we came up with. Okay, um, then the last result I want to show you, which is I think the most spectacular one, is uh, regarding this other band jet radio galaxy, NGC 1272, which is located here in this image. Now, from my own data, so as I said, I work on the low frequency one. This is what you see. Uh, so it was identified before as a band jet radio galaxy. It has this like boomerang, like a little boomerang shape. It's really cute. Uh, I was like, okay, it's not that interesting, except that it's really near that mini halo, right? It's really like almost in that mini halo. Uh, but this is the highest resolution map I had at the time. And I was not, I didn't make a big deal out of it until my colleagues came with the L band observation. So higher frequency, higher resolution. And, and this is what they show me. So yeah, so basically this is, I don't know if you recognize, this is the, the little boomerang shape here. And all of this stuff resolve into this radio tail of emission, okay? Which we didn't know was a radio tail before. We didn't know it was connected to this galaxy, but it seems like it's connected. So you have this winding, channel of emission just on one side, evolving into that eddy-like structure and then two diffuse lobes, okay? Very, very strange. Uh, but this was a really important thing because we always thought that all of this pink stuff in the background uh, was the mini halo, okay? But it seems like part of the mini halo is actually the tail of NGC 272. And it has, this has important implication for our understanding of radio emission in galaxy clusters. Because for, I mean, most likely the electrons coming from the relativistic electron coming from the jet of that galaxy are feeding the mini halo, right? It's not just the central galaxy. There is a contribution from a band jet radio galaxy, okay? Uh, and so, yeah, these band jet radio galaxy are playing a role, probably. They are contributing to the diffuse radio component in galaxy cluster. And uh, seem, like in the same time, basically, we were publishing this. There were another case here of a, this is the, a mini halo as well with the band jet radio galaxy really, really close. We didn't know that because before we were not able to resolve this, but now uh, apparently we are able to, to resolve this and we're finding, finding more and more cases. This is another, a really great example that was, that was published before. You have this merging galaxy cluster, so very extreme um, cluster environment, not like Perseus. And you have this relic here, and there is the radio galaxy right there as well. So it looks like, you know, there's electrons here, probably there's like a shock, and then it reaccelerates those particles. Okay, as you can see in that sort of schematic um, version. So, yeah, so, so band jet radio galaxy are, are kind of important for that. Now, I made this composite image where I kept just the, the radio uh, emission from that galaxy and overlaid it on the optical uh, counterpart just to show how it looks like. Um, and then we tried to, with my, my, my collaborators, we tried to come up with an interpretation, right, of what, what is going on there exactly. We have no, like, we have many answers, let's say, uh, and I'm gonna guide you through a couple of them. Uh, one of the interpretation is that uh, we're catching this galaxy as it is turning around on its orbit through the cluster, okay? Um, so Benjamin radio galaxy, some of them are incoming, some of them are outgoing of cluster. So they must be like in between cases. And maybe this is an in between case. And that would explain why we have you know, it's very strange because you have the Ben jets in front of the rest of the tail, right? So maybe this is like a projection effect. I don't know if you see it, but that's one possibility. Now, uh, another really interesting coincidence, or I don't know if it's a coincidence that if you overlay on top of that image, the, the Chandra observation of the Perseus cluster, it's a bit confusing on that image, but you have the cavity system that I was showing in the center. So this is the central galaxy with the jets and everything. Uh, and there's, there, there is also this sloshing motion happening in the, in the uh, Perseus cluster. And you have one of these fronts uh, uh, right there actually cutting through. 
I mean, everything is in projection, so we don't know exactly. But uh, it's really in between the more collimated part and the more diffuse part, basically. Uh, and so we're really interested about, uh, you know, the impact of a passage of this kind of radio galaxy through a cold front, because this is really like a discontinuity inside the intracluster medium. And maybe that would create some, um, I don't know, reaccelerate the particles in some ways. We don't know exactly. And um, finally, I think um, one of the most striking things I, I saw when I when I first saw this image is that uh, you know similarities with uh, Kármán vortex streets. So Kármán vortex streets are uh, observed in nature on various scales, right? Um, but what's really interesting about them is that they appear only uh, in particular conditions, which are related to the medium. So you have something going through. A medium and you, depending on the viscosity of that medium you will have different patterns okay and and for current vortex street you at least see them for particular sets of of this of viscosity so imagine that you have this galaxy with electrons and like the electrons are kind of following the wake of that galaxy inside the cluster and creating these vortices um so then that means that we would be constraining the viscosity of the intracluster medium, which is something really hard to do with X-ray observations. But can we tell that it's really that? I mean, not really, but it's an interesting um, idea. And it's diff I mean, it's we can say it is definitely not laminar. Maybe it's turbulent. Maybe it's that. We don't know exactly. Okay. So, just to, to conclude about the Perseus uh, cluster part, um, here are all the the different things that we have learned about uh, with this system not only about Perseus, you know, about also galaxy cluster in general. Um, and so I think Perseus is a really fantastic laboratory to uh, understand better uh, these environments. And I think there's many more things that we can learn about this cluster. And so right now I am struggling with <laughs> new VLA observations at higher frequencies. I'm trying to resolve out more, more stuff, but it's taking a long time. So I cannot present you these results yet. Um, yeah. Uh, about the future, I promised that I would talk about the future. Well, the future, we have SKA, right? Uh, which is going to be the largest uh, radio telescope on Earth, tens of thousands of antennas, uh, incredible sensitivity. And for us, it's going to be really important. It's going to find, you know, one million bench jet radio galaxy, thousands of mini halos, halos and relics. Okay, it's really going to change uh, galaxy clusters. And we're really excited about that. Um, and by the way, if you guys are interested about SKA, what SKA can do for your science, you can talk to us, me and Teresa. <laughs> we are uh, encouraging people here to, uh, to use SKA and to learn what it can do for you. So that was my little ad, I guess. Uh, but for us, it's really gonna be really, really important for sure. Um, there is also, I wanted to mention LOFAR, uh, which is already doing a, a lot of, uh, really interesting stuff, but LOFAR is, is, is also going to go to extremely low frequencies, 50 megahertz, okay, really, really low, with this survey, the LOFAR Low Band Antenna Sky Survey, or LULS, whatever, and, uh, and so if you remember that spectrum, so we're keeping pushing to lower and lower radio frequencies, so who knows what we're going to find, uh, what we're going to find with all of this, and this is just a uh, to show you the, the typical sensitivity frequency plot and, and to show you that with low far SK, the two types of antennas of SK and NGVLA, we're really going to cover at very high sensitivity the whole uh, range of frequency that we need to study galaxy clusters and many other things as well. Okay, so uh, the future of galaxy cluster is kind of almost scary because we're going to find so many things. What are we going to do with that? Um, sometimes I have, I'm a bit anxious <laughs> about that. <laughs> For example, how are we going to classify these sources? And this is like a very quick sort of update on the current trend, I would say, of how I think we're going to manage to do all of this, how to classify them. I like this paper from one of my collaborators, Larry, who wants to attribute hashtags to radio galaxies instead of putting them into boxes and try to make them fix into like head tail radio galaxies, but it doesn't work like that. So, you know, one survey could have a series of 
hashtag, let's say, <laughs> to attribute to a class of galaxies. And then another survey would have that and it would evolve into times. That's a one cool idea, I think. Then machine learning will be essential, I think, for the detection and classification of uh, those, those sources. This is just a small selection of paper. I, I, I found uh, this field, of, as you know, is really exploding. And this is good because we're really going to need these kind of uh, studies. Uh, simulation, I've shown you um, this uh, simulation paper. Um, we're going to really need simulation as well to link you know, these radio properties with the galaxy cluster properties. And also magnetic field measurement are more and more uh, possible. Uh, it was a bit complicated in the past. And, and now I think it's, uh, we're going into that direction and that's really helping us as well to understand these systems. Okay, so I think it's not too scary, it's exciting, right? <laughs> not too bad. <laughs> okay, so with the level of quality that we're now reaching uh, uh, with those radio observation, I think we're realizing there's more to understand about this environment. One cool idea uh, that is in the field is that uh, you know, with just based on the radio uh, observation, it would be really cool to use that to understand cluster weather. So this is kind of the term, um, you know, to know if the cluster is merging, what's going on with that cluster, the cluster weather. So this could be used as tracer of that cluster weather. So that's an idea. But all of this work uh, that we're doing right now, uh, I think is paving the way for future radio facilities such as SKA and GVLA, et cetera. And I will stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Marilu. I love it. <laughs> Turbulence, ghosts, multi frequency, multi instrument. Everything. So, yeah, very nice. So, talk uh, is open for questions. Any questions yes. you can go and uh, we can also have questions on Zoom. There was one from Isabel. Oh, yeah, yeah, careful, careful. Thank you. Ah, okay. In fact, I have two questions. Okay. Uh, okay. So first one is, um, uh, is there any one-to-one -one relationship between uh, the um, presence of an AGN in the BCG galaxy and the fact that you don't detect any cooling flow in all clusters. I have to talk in the microphone. <laughs> um, yeah, it's more or less, uh, yes. Like every time you have a cooling flow, basically you have this AGN with some sort of jets or something like that, or, or presence of cavities in the X-ray. This is more or less, yeah, I would say yes. And maybe at higher redshift, it's a bit more difficult to detect. And there's a little bit of um, work on that side, but I, I don't have like a, in my mind, like a current, like an idea of a precise one that fails that. Uh, but in general, yes, it, it's working pretty well. So the second question is related with the presence of filaments in the larger scales. Uh, I mean, with clusters and big structures between clusters. So uh, apparently there is a, a kind of uh, uh, alignment between the clusters and the filament at large scale that in which uh, they reside. So do you think that maybe some kind of relationship between all the motions you you are uh, you think you are seeing in those clusters with the larger scale structure and filaments? Uh, good question. <laughs> Maybe I mean you mean the 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 motion of these galaxies if they are linked with this to larger scale structure. I, I honestly, I, I don't know, but uh, it's, it's an interesting idea. Um, I think we're really, there's, there's, there's a group of people now that are starting to really, uh, because these, these Benjet radio galaxies, like a, it's kind of new that we are seeing many of them and all of that is kind of, we're starting to do these statistic, statistical surveys uh, of these kind of sources. Before that, it was kind of just individual cases. 
So what I would like to do is like, you know, trying to link, you know, what we see in those, in those, you know, the tail, the, the side, like the, how they are aligned with the cluster itself, the galaxy, what kind of galaxy, the, the you know, the, the velocity of that galaxy compared with the cluster and things like that. So it would be really, we are, people are starting to do that, but just starting. So we're not there yet. And so to link that to, even larger scale, I don't know, but uh, maybe one day, one day. It's, it's part of that idea, you know, to, to try to use Radio Galaxy of, to understand bigger picture. That would be really cool. Yeah, I will look into that. <laughs> I knew. Any more difficult place to go? With the microphone? <laughs> I mean, it's 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 more about in the same direction. So, so also what, what Isa has asked. So, uh, we have this uh, intracluster X-ray gas, and and we have the problem. We need to heat it, and apparently that's done by this uh, one huge central black hole of the cluster. But you've mentioned already the the, the big questions. What? So, so I, I wonder what is would be would it be doable to do the statistics? How much of the heating really comes from the brightest cluster galaxy and how much? I mean, if it's if there's a thousand galaxies, uh, there's there must be other relatively massive black holes in accreting. Or is it really all centrally focused? I mean, could somebody do the statistics? Is so so you said that could not be done before. I mean, it all looks very clear. Whenever I see it, I see this huge X-ray halo in the middle, a brightest cluster galaxy, and that's it. Probably like everything in nature, when you look closer, look closer, it looks more complicated. So, so is the reason why? Because this just has not been possible before. You say it's it's only now you can do these studies now with SKA, for example. I mean, to like take it apart and see how much heating comes from which galaxy, etc. Okay. Um. Yeah, big question. Uh, two things like so. Um, I would say that this AGN feedback mechanism, these cavities with those radio jets, this have been done already a few years back. And really, all you need is to calculate how big the cavity is in, in the x ray gas, and you can estimate how much energy does it take to create that. And if you take that energy and you compare with the power of the radio jet in the center, it match in all systems, basically, okay? So that works uh, pretty well. The, what is not fully understood is how the energy is, is, that mechanical energy is transferred to the intracluster medium. Like, is it when the, the because you might think that this feedback is like violent, like this just like, but it's not violent, it's pretty smooth. There's not a lot of shocks, for example, or the shocks that are there are quite faint, okay? So how exactly the energy is transferred to an intracluster medium is, is that part is not fully understood. Is it through shock? Is it turbulence that it generates? All of this is generated. Then is this turbulence coming from also the sloshing? That is maybe uh, that these kind of details are not easy to answer. And um, the problem is that this is the problem on the X-ray side because we don't have, uh, you cannot resolve very well the spectrum in the X-ray. You cannot say exactly what is the, you cannot have a very good uh, velocity map of this intracluster medium, right? You cannot see what's the dispersion of these lines. In this, in this gas. So uh, mission like uh, Hitomi X um, Chrism uh, that is coming are kind of trying to solve this kind of problem because we don't know the energetic. There's like uh, very, uh, I don't know, like uh, other ways to calculate that currently with Chandra and XMM. I don't know exactly how this works, but they have been doing that. Uh, a little bit, but it's not enough really to answer, I think, fully that question, okay? But that's more an X-ray thing right now. Um, on, the, on the radio side, what we have found is more all of this radio emission all over the place in crazy um, filaments and things like that. 
and yeah maybe the question is like now that we know that this is there is it contributing what's you know what's the link i've seen i've shown you a couple of comparison for example that cold front that goes through there there is some interaction there but this is super hard right now to understand um, because we don't have so we're just starting to resolve the radio side and for the x-ray map i mean the the observation of Perseus is like super, super, super deep, right? And that's why we see a lot of details. We cannot have that for all of the clusters. Um, but yeah, that's another uh, kind of, I don't know if that answered the question. Okay, first key. Easier. Yeah, and um, I was just wondering about the, the energy budget in this whole uh, scheme because uh, you have the BCD uh, fighting against the cooling of the hot gas of the intercluster medium. So, um, also the powerful energetic uh, mechanical release in order to prevent that, which is fueling this uh, BCD galaxy. I mean, it's like um, it. What is fueling? I mean their own gas because you are preventing other gas from the inflow to the galaxy so this is a scenario with a limited time i mean there will be a moment where the galaxy will run out of uh, gas and then we shouldn't see so maybe there is a snapshot some somewhere in the universe at some let's say receive x uh, where we can see actually uh, um, the central galaxy with no mechanical energy releasing and then the ICM uh, cooling towards the galaxy. Is it this expected or, or not? Yes, this is a, yeah, there's many aspects to that. Um, yeah, first thing that comes to my mind is also that we don't know exactly if, if these outbursts from the jets are constant or, or like one outburst and then another one and things like that. And, uh, but, and then for, I think we're, according to simulation, even if it's just outbursts, it should be still like, it's not gonna, the cooling is not gonna happen in the meantime. Like it's enough, the time scale are kind of, according to simulation, okay. So the, what I mean is that even if it's not constant uh, out, in, um, like output of energy inside the ICM, ICM the time scale seems to be fitting and that it, the cooling doesn't happen in between, okay? Because of the time that it takes from these uh, cavities to, I don't know, spread energy inside the intracluster medium. But it's a really good question. And also like uh, another thing uh, that I was thinking is that, you know, it's really curious that the supermassive black hole kind of knows <laughs> that it has to input that exactly amount of energy to prevent the cooling from happening. It's a bit weird. Right, so there must be, so it's a feedback, right? So we know that part where the jets like inject in, well, we more or less know that the jets inject energy in the intracluster medium, but how does this, how does this feedback loop close? That's also um, not very well understood. And one of the possible way to understand that is those filaments, right? That I told you that we don't really know exactly what they are doing. And one of the, the idea is that uh, these filaments are actually intracluster medium that condensates into filaments and then eventually feed the supermassive black hole. That's how the loop would be sort of closed. So it's kind of raining a little bit of gas inside the galaxy by condensation through those filaments. Okay, that's that's one idea. Uh, also, there's other people that says that these cavities, that these jets, these bubbles that are released are kind of taking gas of that galaxy and are like lifting up that gas, creating those filaments. And there's these two ideas that we, we really don't know. And the, the thing is that I wanted to, with that, with this case, if you look at the velocity map, it's really not clear. It's really turbulent, chaotic. And we don't really know if the filaments aren't, you cannot see that the filaments are all like outgoing or in falling or something like that. It's really more disturbed. And it's the case for many of those filaments. So many people are working on that right now, I would say. But perhaps that with these filaments, we're going to understand that, how this feedback loop works. Yeah.
Mm, yeah, uh, so we, we, we do know that there are galaxies in which we know that the activity has been restarted several times. So would they, I mean, have you considered the possibility of the restarting activity being able to explain the weird morphologies you see in some of those? Well, more or less, I would say, that maybe answer part of your question. These, um, I mean, I think, yeah, I think it must be. Uh, and, and one of these cases like these, these Phoenix, right, for example, um, I mean, there's patches of radio emission that have very, very steep spectrum. Um, that means that the population of electrons, right, as I was saying, are really <laughs> like old. And so they haven't been feeding by any um, directly by a jet recently. So that would be one one case. For example, that uh, that galaxy group here um, in that paper, they show that this is like many many generation of outbursts. Like four, I think four different types of outbursts. Uh, like the first one very close to the center. The second one, this would be the third, and the fourth. I don't remember exactly, but this would be all radio bubbles at different stage, you know? And, and then with interaction with the intracluster medium, you, you maybe you can create those filaments. So that's, yes, it goes into that direction. Yeah. <laughs> so, so last question, do, do you expect to have some differences between the the agent hosts uh, if it is the BCG or if it is not, because you have different feeding mechanism. And, I mean, it's easier to feed the BCG, but not the other one. So could they be different? Yes. So yeah. So this is really not my my field, but there's a lot of studies of, of brightest cluster galaxy, and they really are different from from other galaxy, from from galaxies also inside the, the cluster. So they have different properties. Ah, the AGN activity. Mm, that I don't know. Like, you mean the how powerful they are or things like that? There must be studies about that, but uh, but I don't know. I don't know. I think in general they find more active galaxies, radio galaxies inside galaxy clusters, uh, and and that that's all I know. I don't. I cannot say. Yeah, should do a little research about that. <laughs> So I see no questions at Zoom, no more questions here. So we can close the talk here. Thank you very much again. Thank you. I'll see you all next week.